Good morning. So good to see you here in the sanctuary today. I'm so glad that you uh, braved it out and weren't confused by the, the recent order that was, uh, that was presented. Uh, just to give you a heads up, the order does not apply to churches. So uh, if you're watching online, hopefully we'll uh, plan on keeping everything safe. And, you know, God has, has really blessed us. You know, we've been open for two months now. And thanks to Kathy, who's been heading the uh, reopen committee and the rest of that group, uh, we've been following procedures and doing things. We haven't had one reported sickness as a result of coming. And, you know, I think God is going to honor and bless those who are standing firm and standing strong. And uh, rather than giving in to fear or following him and being obedient and gathering, we're going to talk a little bit about that today uh, in Ephesians 5. But I uh, want to thank you so much. It takes courage to get out of your home when everybody tells you you should stay at home. It takes a lot of courage to, uh, to be here and, and to trust that God's going to take care of you. So I want to encourage you for that. For those who are at home watching on live stream, I don't want you to feel any guilt about that. We're glad that you're joining us and that you're participating in worship. And we're thankful that you are a part of our family. And to the extent that we can help you in any way, please reach out to us, email us, call us, send a carrier pigeon, whatever you need to do so that we can help serve you and, uh, and help you uh, during this uh, time. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm chapter 3. While you're turning there, I will remind you that our, our offering plate is at the door. Um, so if you would please uh, give as God has laid on your heart. If he hasn't laid anything on your heart, don't give anything. But if God has laid something on your heart on your way out, the, the offering plate is there. Uh, please give uh, in, in accordance as God has blessed you with generosity. And also a reminder that we are having a revival service this afternoon at 3 p.m. at the Southampton County uh, Franklin uh, Fairgrounds with uh, Jonathan Lotz, who's the grandson of Billy Graham. And uh, he's going to be preaching. I'm going to be leading the worship this afternoon. So I uh, certainly want to remind you about that and invite you to come. Just make sure you bring your own lawn chair uh, unless you want to stand up and worship the whole time and stand up and listen to the preaching. So uh, we certainly want to invite you uh, to participate in that. Psalm 3, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist writes, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah, which means to consider, think about it. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on all your people. Selah. Let's call out to God this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship. Father, we thank you, God, that you bring salvation to your people. We thank you that you protect us from enemies. God, that you are a shield, that you're our glory and the lifter of our heads. So, Father, as we come today, may we return to you praise and honor and glory and worship. May we sing unashamedly with loud voices full of love for you and thankfulness and gratitude. May we listen to your word and be open to transformation and change. God, so that we can be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate example for us that we should follow in his steps. So God, may you be honored by our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together as we sing, Come Thou Almighty King. The lyrics are in the bulletin. Father all glorious or all victorious. 
Testament reading. A reading from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Thank you, Fred. Our pastoral prayer today will be that we be a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. When we try to do things in our own strength and in our own power, we fail, don't we? We try to be better. We try to do good. We try to live as best we can. But when we're living in this body of sinful flesh, we're going to fail. So we depend on the Spirit of God. But we don't just need the Spirit of God in our lives and in our church. We also need to pray that God's Spirit will move across our land, will move across our country. During this time of fear and anxiety and worry and stress and sickness, we need God to move in our land to give us a spirit of power and trust and faith in who God is. Because without Him... And without the Spirit moving, our nation will falter. We already see it. We already see what our nation is like. The further that we're getting away from God and further away from His Word and further away from His truth. And that's why it's so important for us as a church to make sure in our own homes and in our own families we're reading God's Word, we're praying together, we're spending time worshiping the Lord. So I want to pray today that God will fill us with His Spirit And that we will listen to his voice. Father, we thank you, God, that when we give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, that he doesn't leave us here to wander alone, to try to figure things out for ourselves, to go on a a life's journey blind, but that you have given us the Holy Comforter, God, to direct us and to guide us and to lead us. So, Father, I pray that all of us in here that have given our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ would surrender to the control of the Holy Spirit. God, may our every thoughts, may our every actions be led and guided by the third person of the Trinity. God, I pray that you will allow your Spirit to move in a mighty way across our nation and across our land. God, our country is in turmoil with the sicknesses, with the virus, with the economy, with our elections, with riots. God, the enemy is at war with us. We need your spirit. We can't elect our way out of this. We can't work our way out of this. We need you. So God, we pray that your spirit will move. God, send revival to our land. 
as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite the boys and girls to come up front. Find a piece of paper to stand on. <clears throat> oh, it's nice to have so many. Wonderful. We've got lots of papers. That one's orange like your dress. All right. Okay, this morning. I'm going to talk to you about superheroes. Does anybody know who this stands for? Oh, y'all know Superman? He was cool when I was a little girl. I didn't know. Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, Superman was a pretty big deal. How about this other one? You know that's Batman? Let's see. Let me get him right side up. Yeah, we got Batman with the with a bat signal well with my computer <laughs> that's why it's just like it's supposed to be um, most of them have some kind of secret weapon or some superpower something that only they can do that makes them uh, get out of trouble and helps them catch the bad guys now Superman he was super strong and he was fast and he had x-ray vision and could see through he what and he could fly and laser eyes right x-ray vision he could see right through the walls and all kinds of things how about power rangers do y'all know about power rangers do you okay um and each one of them has a special power right each individual how about now, these are the ones that I like because uh, Margo and I look at Paw Patrol like a lot. Every one of them has something special they can do, right? They, if something's going on in the water, they call the one with the, with the boat and whatever. And if there's something. One's a police officer, right? Right. And then there's the one that's an airplane person. If they have to go way up in a tree or higher than that. Well, I'm going to tell you today about our superpowers. Christians have superpowers, too. That's right. That's, that's the beginning of it all. Um, and it's, our reading is going to be in just a minute from Ephesians. And um, this is a letter that was written to the Christians who lived in a city called Ephesus. Now, that's why we call it Ephesians. If the letter had been written to us, they'd probably call it Virginians. This letter was written many years ago by one of the first Christians named Paul. Now, Paul was a great leader in the church just after Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul traveled around a whole lot, and he made friends for Christ. He liked to keep in touch with all these people that he met, and he liked to reach out to others that he knew were trying to follow Christ. He was helping to build the first church. The first Christians often had problems. The part of the Bible, the New Testament, that's about Jesus hadn't been written yet. So they were trying to figure out how to be a church, and they were trying to, um, sometimes they had a few scraps among themselves and were not happy with each other. And sometimes they just didn't know what the right thing to do was because they couldn't open their New Testament and, and read it like we can. So Paul's letter answers their questions and gives them advice on how to be better followers of Christ. Even though this letter was written 2,000 years ago, its advice is still good for us today as we try to be better Christians. That's one of the coolest things about the Bible. It's a roadmap for us, it's an advice book, and it's still just as important to read now as it was then. Have you ever been angry? Yes. What did you do when you were angry? Ooh, stuff we don't want to tell, right? Um, no, you don't want to tell me. Right, you don't want to tell us. Um, 
in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul tells them what to do when they are angry. Everybody gets angry sometimes, and that's okay. Paul doesn't tell the Ephesians not to get angry. Instead, he tells them they have two secret weapons that they can use when they start to feel angry. One of them is love. Paul tells the Ephesians and us to imitate God and Christ. <clears throat> he tells us to live in love. He says, be tender and kind. <coughs> Sorry. That sounds simple, doesn't it? Be tender and kind all the time. <coughs> well, sometimes we forget, and we look for ways to get even with people who make us mad. Well, that comes down to the second secret weapon. <coughs> this secret weapon is really powerful, and it's a real superpower. If you learn to use it, you'll be a superhero. And you don't have to be big and strong to use it. You just have to practice it. <coughs> My school teacher voice doesn't hold that very long anymore. <clears throat> this powerful secret weapon is forgiveness. Sometimes, maybe even most of the time, it's a hard thing to forgive somebody when we're angry. But you'll be surprised if you work at it. You'll discover that once you forgive someone, the other person feels better. And so do you. It sounds impossible, but let's all give it a try. The next time we get angry, let's look for a way to forgive. Might be hard at first, and it does take a lot of practice. And I can tell you, even grown-ups have to work at this a lot. But we can do it, and God will help us. I hope you don't get angry this week. It's not fun to feel angry. But if you do start to feel anger, stop and remember your secret power, forgiveness. Take a deep breath, and while you're exhaling, think of a way you can forgive. And then work at it. Practice. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for reminding us of the secret power, the superpowers that you have given us love and forgiveness teach us to use these tools and practice forgiveness rather than anger thank you for your love in jesus name amen all right take your bibles please turn to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 Whoever would have thought we had to explain why we cough <laughs> every every day now, right? If you cough, uh oh, do they have do they have it? Do they have the it? Have to explain it all the time now, uh, especially those of us who talk all the time, like me and Fred, and we're in the courtroom, and you know things get a little uh, muggy in there, and we start coughing. Everybody starts giving you that bad eye, like oh, here we go. So, just a whole different world these days. But uh, I guess that's why we have the, uh, the military checkpoint at the front to get your temperature and all that stuff. So um, make sure everybody's good, everybody's safe. And, um, you know, if you are sick, yeah, you know, out of love for your brothers and sisters, you should stay home. It's, now's the time to do that, you know. Uh, don't, don't be cavalier with your brothers and sisters in Christ either. We shouldn't live in fear, but we shouldn't be cavalier. There's a, a balance there. Maybe I should write a poem about that. Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you 
as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the word of the Lord. It's the word that he has for us today. You know, if you were to do a Google search for most asked questions about God and the Bible and the Christian life, one of the questions that is most asked is, what is God's will for my life? People are looking for a sense of purpose. They're looking for a reason why they belong. It led one pastor of a mega church in California to write the second most popular book in history next to the Bible, which was The Purpose Driven Life. Uh, And in that book, he gives 40 days worth of uh, studies and things of that nature to, to help discover your purpose. One of my professors at seminary requires us to to read one of his books. It's one of the biggest gigs ever, right? If you're a professor, write a book, you can make your students buy it. So, you know, it seems pretty smart to me. Maybe I need to figure out how to do that. But uh, he required us to buy his book, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And it was a very good book on on going through biblical principles. And it's almost like people think that, that God has like some hidden will for me to do or for you to do and that we have to go on this quest to discover what it is God has us to do and so as a result people sometimes get discouraged because they think wow I'm not really happy with my life I don't think that I'm doing what God is is wanting me to do what he's planned for me to do and we can give in to worry and, and doubt about whether we're walking in what God has for us But in this letter to the Ephesians on church revitalization, Paul is trying to encourage the the people of Ephesus to understand that they can clearly know what God's will is for them. It's not a secret. It's not hidden. It's not something they have to dig up like a buried treasure. It's something that God has laid out before them, right before their eyes. And he wants them to understand that there are signs that they are understanding God's will that they can know that they are doing what is pleasing to the Lord and discern what the will of the Lord is. And in this text, he gives three signs to the Ephesians of how they can recognize that they understand God's will. 
Likewise, today, we can apply these same three signs to our lives to know whether we understand what the will of God is for our lives. Isn't that a great thing to know? That we can know that we're walking in the right way with what God has for us? So let's dive in this morning and see what God has about how we can see that we understand God's will. Number one, the first sign that you understand God's will is when we are imitating God. When we are imitating God. In verses 1 and 2, Paul tells the church at Ephesus that in light of the previous text that we've read in chapter 4 that we went over last week, we should be imitators of God. The Greek word for imitate there is where we get our word mimic, where we mimic someone. He is saying we are to mimic God. He is saying, you Ephesians, you need to be mimicking what, who God is and what he does. We should be copying him. And the first specific of that he gives in verse 2 where it says to walk in love. And he challenges them not just to love in a human sense or in a sense that we love our family members. No, he's saying love in the same way that Christ loved us. And how did he do that? He loved by presenting himself as an offering. The word offering means to bring voluntarily. Jesus was a voluntary offering in love. But it's not just a voluntary bringing, it's also a sacrificial love. It says that he was a fragrant sacrifice to God. And sacrifice means that something died, that something was slain on the behalf of a God. And Christ was slain in love for us and for the church of Ephesus in love. So that they would be able to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is the example that Paul is telling the church at Ephesus that they need to mimic. They need to be copying the example of God and Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, I kind of alluded to this in the pastoral prayer. But it says, for to this you have been called. You want to know what you've been called to, church? This is what we are called to. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We are to follow Christ's example of sacrifice and offering in love. Last night we had the revival service at Cortland Baptist and uh, Jonathan Lotz was preaching. My son was sitting right beside me. And uh, he was watching uh, how the evangelist was moving his arms. And when the evangelist would start pointing, he would start pointing, just like he did. And when he, he started doing his hand motions a certain way, he started doing the hand motions a certain way. I was glad that uh, the, the minister wasn't watching during that time. But at the, on the inside, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. He's copying a preacher. It could, it could be a lot worse. But it's interesting, right? Children mimic what they see. They mimic what they do. You know, I, I enjoy, I have to admit, my cups of coffee in the morning. If I don't have it, I'm not very Christian. You know, that's my liquid Holy Spirit in the morning. Uh, please don't call me before 7 o'clock unless it's an extreme emergency because I'm a completely different person before 7 than I am after I've had my coffee in me, okay? But my kids pick up on that. And so, you know, they'll come down, and I'm like going into the room, and they're like, oh, Daddy, i got to go in and get my coffee. I've got to get my coffee. And, and they're just making fun of me, mimicking me. But, you know, that's what Paul is challenging us today. We are to mimic God. We are to copy God. So how are we going to do that? How does this apply to us today? Well, first of all, we need to make sure we understand who God is. That calls on us to make sure we're going through the Word of God and learning who God is because we can't copy what we don't see. We can't copy what we don't know and recognize. So we need to be studying when God says God is love, what does that look like? Well, it looks like Christ and His sacrifice. When it says that God is holy, what does that mean? So you read that and you study and you understand that it means that you're pure and you hate sin and you mimic that. When it says that God is a God of mercy, what does that mean? 
That means that you show people favor even when they don't deserve it. And so we need to be reading God's Word so that we can know what to mimic. And then once we understand what it is, then we need to do it. We mimic God with, first of all, our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's talking about when he says walk in love. He's talking about walking in love together, just as Christ loved you. You love your fellow church members to the point that you're willing to sacrifice for them voluntarily. You lay down your rights for the rights of others. You don't hold on to things that you want to hold on to. You lay them down and sacrifice them at the feet of Jesus and at the feet of your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it means to mimic God. And that's a sure sign that you're in God's will. It doesn't take a, you know, a plane flying around with a little message. It's clear as day. It's understanding what is pleasing to God and understanding what the will of the Lord is. Secondly, the second sign that we understand God's will is when we are divorced from immorality. When we're divorced from immorality. In verses 3 through 16, Paul calls out uh, all manner of sin. It says sexual immorality, which is the Greek word porneia. I'm sure you can understand where you can go with that. There's no need for me to dwell there. Impurity is when you are living a secularized life. You're living for today. You're not living for eternity. You need to shun that. Impurity is living for yourself and living for the things of this world. And covetousness is when you desire something to the point that you are worshiping it. I've got to have that. I have to have more money. I have to have a bigger house. I have to have a bigger car. I have to have this. You know, sorry, if you were expecting a TV preacher who's telling you you should have everything in the world, this isn't the one. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we're not to love these things. We're not to desire covetousness. And Paul is telling this church that is steeped in sexual sin and steeped in secularization and steeped in covetousness that they need to shun that because it's not proper for saints to be engaged in those things. But it goes beyond just the actions. He also goes to the words that he's using. He says no filthiness. No coarse joking. Saying things that are not pleasing. Saying things that are foolish and out of place. In other words, those words and phrases that take away your mouth from giving praise to God and lifting up your brothers and sisters are instead words of destruction and filth or waste. He's telling them that you need to guard your mouth. And that's interesting because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our words reveal what's in our heart. And so we understand, and, and the church of Ephesus can understand that, that one of the signs that they're, out of, that they're in God's will is that they avoid that kind of foolish talk. Now there were teachers in Ephesus, apparently, who were saying things that, that hey, it's okay. He said, Paul tells him, he says, don't let people deceive you with empty words, words that are, that are empty, that are, that are worthless. There were teachers coming in saying, hey, listen, when you give your life to Christ, you've got your ticket to heaven, you're, you're good to go, you can live however you want to live. You can do whatever you want to do. Just pray a little prayer. And then you can go out and, and be in relationships with whoever you want to be with. You can say whatever you want to say. You can do whatever you want to do. You just pray this little prayer and you've got your fire insurance. And Paul wanted to make sure they understood that that's not the case. He says, don't let them deceive you. Because of these things, not these people, not these false teachers, but these things, what things? Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness. Coarse joking, foolish talk, those things. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And so he says, don't partner with them. Or in other words, don't marry them. Don't marry with these things. Don't marry with sexual immorality. Don't marry with impurity. Don't marry with covetousness. And don't marry with foolish talk, coarse joking, and filthiness. Don't partner with them. Don't marry them. Why? Because we were once those things. We were once darkness. Now we're children of light. I 
That's who we were. And that's what we are. And in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 5, it said, if you engage in those things, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Remember in, in chapter 1 where we talked about when you're a believer in Christ, when you've truly repented of your sin and you turn to God and you've given your life to Christ, you have an inheritance in heaven for you. But people who live in this lifestyle, who have never repented, who have never turned from these things, have no inheritance. In other words, you are not a child of God if this is your lifestyle. If you give in to those things, if this is your life, you are identified as a sexually immoral person, as an impure, secularized person, as a person who has a filthy mouth, or a mouth that doesn't lift up, doesn't praise. There's been no repentance. And where there's been no repentance, there is no inheritance. So he challenges them to walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good, in other words, all that's generous and giving, which is the opposite of covetousness, what is right or righteous, and truth, which comes from the Word of God. And he says, and try, that word try doesn't mean, well, I hope I know what's pleasing to God. The word try here is the, is the Greek word for testing of metal. When they tested metal to make sure that it was strong and sure, you put it to the test. You try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. What does that mean? That means you know what God's will is. You can test it. You test it by being divorced from immorality. And so it says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Show them for what they are. Now you don't show it with your mouth, because the next verse it says, it's even shameful to speak of those things that are done in secret. You don't just expose them by preaching against sin. You, know, you don't expose it by sharing and gossiping with what they're doing. Oh, did you hear what so-and-so has done? They've been in a relationship outside of marriage, and they shouldn't have been doing that. That's shameful. You don't do that. You don't do it by gossiping. Gossiping doesn't fix it. How do we fix that? By living a life of light. Paul tells the, the church at Ephesus, when you live a life of light, it exposes the darkness. It shows the darkness for what it is. It's like being in a dark room. You shine the flashlight. The flashlight exposes what's out there. You don't have to talk about how dark it was. You just show the light, and the light shows what it is. You live a life of light, and it exposes them for the darkness. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Anything that is visible is light. And then he writes this uh, Christian hymn that most scholars say is a Christian hymn, a baptismal hymn. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. So he challenges them. Look carefully at how you walk, how you live, whose steps you're walking in. Making the best use of time. Making the best use of your life. Making the best use of your circumstances. Making the best use of where you are because the days are evil they're immoral days so God calls us to be divorced from immorality 2 Corinthians six seventeen, the apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth something very similar they were clearly living in all types of sexual sin if you haven't read the, uh, the book of Corinthians it's a, it's a strong read it's a very hard book uh, for some church folks. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Therefore, go out from their midst. Some translations say, go out from among them. And be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. He's telling the church at Corinth, you have to come out from among them and be separate. Now, that doesn't mean like a pharmaceutical separation where you're, you're not spending time with the lost because we should be engaging the lost. But what that means is we should not be engaging in their thought processes, their lifestyle, their desires, their motives. We shouldn't be mingling with ideas of the world. We should be separate from that. We should be living a life of light. I'm not a cook. 
My wife's a great cook. I'm not a cook. You don't want to eat anything I make for you anyway. But suppose I was a great cook. Then we'll have a fun time pretending today. And I was going to make you all a nice batch of hot, steaming chocolate chip cookies. Whew, hallelujah. It's almost time to say amen. We can go get some cookies. But in that mix of chocolate chip cookie dough, I put one tiny little drop of poison in there. Just a tiny little drop. And I mix it in, stir it up, I patty out the cookies, put them on a pan, put them in the oven, bake to perfection. The steam is flowing off the cookies. I put them on a plate, and I say, here you go. Here is your chocolate chip cookies. But there's one thing. I put one tiny little drop of poison in the mix. Who's going to eat that cookie? Y'all must just not be hungry. Nobody's going to eat that cookie. Because that one bit of poison ruins the entire mix. And likewise, we need to look at sin as poison. And when we see sin as poison, we know that we are walking in God's will. And we understand what God's will is for our lives. It's to be completely divorced. To end the marriage with sin and our sinful lifestyle and sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. Grasping for things that's ours. As if we're God. We need to divorce that. It's the only divorce Christians should truly have. Is divorce from sin. But we love our sin, don't we? We cherish it. There's those sins that easily beset us. What we should do is first ask God through the Holy Spirit to reveal to us unconfessed and unrepentant sin in our lives. And once he's identified that for us, we need to repent of it. And ask God to forgive us. And you know what's great? It's God will forgive us every single time. Every single time. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to wonder if God hates you, if God's mad at you. He wants to forgive you. But you just have to ask him to show you what sin you have in your life and confess it and repent of it and turn away from your sin and divorce it. Separate from it. Come out from among it and be separate. Surrender it to him. We can read in the scriptures verses like Psalm, uh, passages like Psalm 51, Psalms of confession, and confess and repent to God. We can turn from our sin. We also may want to consider getting an accountability partner in our church. Someone in the church that can keep you accountable and help you walk in things. You know, if you're struggling with a specific sin, some sort of addiction, some sort of uh, thing that just it, it is so difficult, that's why it's important for us to gather as a body so that we can keep each other accountable and we can love each other. We apply the first principle of imitating God by loving our brothers and sisters enough to keeping them accountable. That's what we're here for. We're not here just to show up and check a box that we came to church, right? We're here to encourage each other and spur each other on to godliness. Number three, the third sign that we understand God's will is when we are filled with the Spirit. When we are filled with the Spirit. Paul writes to the uh, Ephesians and he tells them, he says, look, let's talk about what the will of the Lord is. He says, let's make sure that we understand what it is that God would have us to do. In verse 17, it says, don't be foolish, but understand what God's will is. And as a result of that, he says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be drunk. Don't give yourself to too much alcohol. Why? Because it leads to the word debauchery. Now, debauchery is not a word I use very often. Now, it's probably not one of the top thousand words that I use. Probably the only time I use the word debauchery is when I'm reading out loud from the Bible. The word debauchery means to excess to squander. It's essentially the word that the prodigal son was engaged in when he lived in riotous living, when he went out and squandered all the inheritance from his father. When we get drunk, 
alcohol gains control. And it was no different in Ephesus. The Ephesians were getting drunk and they were losing control of themselves. They were making poor decisions. They were squandering their money. They were spending things on stupid things they shouldn't have spent it on. They were, they were making poor decisions with their health and with their life. And that's what happens when you let alcohol or other substances gain control of your life. And that's part of God's will too, is don't be drunk. Don't lose control of your body, which is the temple of the Lord. But instead, be filled or also drunk with the Spirit. Instead, he's telling the church of Ephesus, instead of giving yourself to these alcohol parties in, in, uh, in uh, the goddess Diana's temple, you need to be drunk with the Spirit. You need to be controlled and constantly filled by the Spirit of God. That Greek word for filled is a present passive verb, which means that you are filled and continually being filled. Go on being filled with the Spirit. But it, because it's passive, it's not something you can do. You can't fill yourself with the Spirit. You have to allow the Spirit to fill you. You have to call out to God to fill you with the Spirit. It's something that God does. Now, what happens when we're filled with the Spirit? How do we know that we are filled? Well, three things happen. Well, first, we encourage each other to praise. We encourage each other to praise. It says addressing one another. See, we can't... This is, this is one of the reasons why churches have to gather. And we have to do it safely. But this is a commandment of God to address one another. We don't just sing at home. We don't just, we can't just have church at home. You can't, biblically. Because you can't address one another. We address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing to the Lord with your heart. So corporately, when we are filled with the Spirit, we encourage each other to sing together. Which is why we sing in every service. That's why we worship. We spur each other on to praise. And that's why we have to gather. Church is essential. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what anybody on Facebook says. The church is essential. Amen? Oh, come on. The church is essential. Amen? Come on. You know that's true. We have to sing to each other. I need to hear you sing. It encourages me to worship. You need to hear me sing. Even when it's not done great. Even when I forget to put a lyric line on the bulletin. We still need to sing. I made up some pretty good words this morning, I thought. We have to dress each other in psalms and praise. But the second thing when we're filled with the Spirit is, is that we're grateful. We're thankful to God. We have gratitude. And, and you know, people say, well, you should be thankful in everything, but not for everything. Well, that's about as unscriptural a philosophy as I've ever seen. Because what does Paul say to the church at Ephesus? He says, giving thanks always and for everything. Does that mean I need to be thankful for the bad things in my life? Yes! Because they're all part of God's plan. He's not taken by surprise. He's not taken by surprise when your spouse decides they want to leave you. He's not taken by surprise when your house catches on fire. He's not surprised when the doctor comes in and gives you bad news. He's not surprised. But when we're filled with the Spirit, we have an attitude of gratitude in and for everything. That's a mark of a Spirit-filled believer. And the third one is the hardest when we're filled with the Spirit, we submit to one another out of reverence for God. We say, I would rather you have your way than me. I'd rather you have your way than my way. I submit myself to you. I might want things to be a certain way. This might be the way that I like it, the way I'm comfortable with. But I'm willing to lay that down for you. Whew. That's hard in church, isn't it? In our meetings and committees and other things, we, we want to have things the way we want it to be. Not just here, that's, your, that's church-wide. That's universal. Because we all want our own way. We all want what we think is best. But 
when we're filled with the Spirit, we say, no, I submit myself. And we can't get there if we're not imitating Christ. We can't get there if we're still married to immorality. And we can't get there if we're not filled with the Spirit. You know, as an attorney, I've done several DUI cases, and I know Fred has too. And one of the things we get in discovery a lot of times are the videos. You want to have a good time, you watch a good DUI video when they're actually intoxicated. I mean, they have them try to do the walk the line thing, and, and you can just tell that alcohol has just completely consumed them. And, and they're just stumbling around, they can't keep their feet in front of each other, it's, it's a mess. Because they have given complete control to alcohol. And they've lost who they are. They can't say the alphabet. They can't stand on one leg for more than five seconds. I mean, the alcohol has completely consumed them. But let me ask you this, church. Are we fully consumed and controlled by the Spirit of God? Are we drunk with the Holy Spirit? Or are we still in control? That's what we need to be praying about, isn't it? Pray that God would fill us with His Holy Spirit. That He would make us so that we can encourage each other on to praise. So that we can encourage each other on to thanks. So that we can thank God for all of His blessings, even in the hard times. And pray that he would fill us so that we can submit to one another. So that we can lay down our rights for our brothers and sisters in Christ. See, understanding the will of God is not a secret. It's not a hard thing to figure out. We need to be imitators of God. We need to be divorced from immorality. And we need to be filled with the Spirit. If you're doing those things, it doesn't matter what you do in your job. You can be... You can be the person that turns the signs on the road and be in the perfect will of God. You can be a person that's a lawyer and a pastor and be in the perfect will of God. You can be a person who's uh, engaging in banking, finance, teaching, whatever. It doesn't matter what you do for your career. There's no magic bullet there. The issue is, is are you imitating God? Are you divorced from sin? And are you filled with the Spirit? And if you're doing those things, you are in the center of God's will. You don't have to worry about it. The question is, are you in the center of God's will? Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know your purpose for your life because you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. When the Bible teaches that Jesus was born of a virgin, it's what we celebrate at Christmas. We'll be dealing with that in December when we go through the Gospel of Matthew. That child grew up until a man lived a perfect, sinless life. And ultimately, he died for you in me, on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin because only God could pay the penalty for our sin because only God is perfect. He died for you and for me as our perfect substitute. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, but he didn't stay there. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And the proof of that is the empty tomb. It would have been easy for all these skeptics to just say, hey, we found the body. We found the body they didn't because he rose from the dead and right now he's seated at the right hand of the father waiting for you to give your life to Christ so if you don't know Jesus you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior I invite you to meet with me after church tonight or th this afternoon and I'll be glad to share the gospel with you you've heard it we just tell you how to accept it repent from your sins but maybe you're a church member today and you're not walking in God's will because you're not imitating God. You're still in love and married to sin. You're not filled with the Spirit. Why don't you confess and repent that today and turn back to God and ask Him to help you walk in those ways. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the difficult truths that it teaches us. God, we ask, Lord, that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, God, that they will give their life to you today. Father, for the church members who need revitalization in their lives, God, so that they can follow you and mimic you, and God, so they can be torn from their sins, and God, that they can be filled with the Spirit. I pray that they will surrender to your call today. 
God, may they never live another day outside of your will. May I never live another day outside your will. God, we know we're not going to be perfect. But God, that's our aspiration. And we trust you, God, that you can do it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together and sing, Spirit of the Living God is our song of decision. I know there's a couple folks that are going to be coming to join our church. So as we sing together, I invite uh, those two of you to come on forward. And um, we'll address that uh, as we sing. Let's stand together as we sing, Spirit of the Living God. so glad today to have with us uh, Jerry Putnam and wave for us. All right. We have Elizabeth Wheeland. Wave your hand for us. And Brendan Trower. Wait, make sure I said a Trower, right? Trower. Thank you. All right. They are here today to join our fellowship this morning. What a great day to have our, our, some new members come in this beautiful sanctuary. And we're so glad that God has led you to us. So if you are uh, in favor of them joining for us, I would ask you to just everybody in here, just give them a nice wave this morning since we can't do the handshaking thing. Anybody who doesn't want them to join, you may leave now. Well, welcome to our fellowship. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to help you and support you, please email me. My cell phone gets emailed out. Um, give me a, a call. Uh, the best way to get with me is with my legal secretary <laughs> but, but, or with Laverne. Laverne is a, is a, is a godsend. Bless, bless her for everything she does. Thank you all so much for joining our church. And you all are welcome to go back. Let's give them a hand this morning. Don't forget our revival uh, next week. Also, we'll have church next Sunday for our special Thanksgiving service. And uh, as you can tell from where we are in Ephesians, next Sunday we're going to have a little bit of fun learning about what examples of submission look like. And uh, sometimes it's, it's things that can get a little touchy, can get a little uh, excitable. So uh, invite some people. Tell them, hey, the preacher might be preaching on something controversial next week. It'll be kind of fun. So uh, maybe we can have a packed out house for our Thanksgiving service, and I can really give you all something to be thankful for. Will the Lord bless you and keep you? May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord grant you peace. God bless you. Have a great week.